Welcome back to Division One Rejects. I'm your host, Kobe Manzo. This is D1R 183. Josh Kolka, Dalen Smith, two fantastic guests joining me on tonight's episode. Kolka, the quarterback from the Cougars, the NAIA level, down at St. Francis. Dalen Smith, the tight end that scored arguably the biggest touchdown of this last week for Southern Nazarene, upsetting the number three team in the country on Thursday night, on Halloween, a spooky outcome, if you will. They take down Watchtop Baptist in what is one of the biggest upsets in Division II football history. So excited to talk to both of these guys as we get into the show. But like I said, this is D1R 183, and uh, we've got some great stuff to cover. For the third week in a row, the number one team in Division II football has been upset. Pittsburgh State falls to UCM. We'll talk about that later as well. I had some big-time kind of... Uh, Ranking shakeups in the D3 scene as well. We've got some more rankings to take a look at. We had the first regional rankings and breakdown at the D2 level to determine the playoff seeding and bracketology for the D2 playoffs. So excited to take a look at that kind of look there. But amongst other things, we have the 30 remaining unbeaten teams in college football. Kind of a cool little graphic here from Reddit College Football. And you'll notice we have a couple of the D2 teams represented. Not many. Almost nobody in D2 has been left unscathed. Kutztown in the PSAC is one of them. Valdosta State down in the Gulf South. And then finally, Charleston in the MEC. All of them still unbeaten. At the D3 level, there's quite a few more. I mean, you go down that list. I'm not even going to name all of them. We've got some NAI teams kind of footnoted at the bottom there. And, uh, you know, D3 is kind of ridiculous in that we have so many of these teams that are unbeaten, but uh, not for long. Where The playoff football is, is very shortly going to be upon us. But I will not waste too much of your time in the opening. we got some great things to talk about tonight. D3, NAI, D2 football all across the board. But as always, you can watch the episode on YouTube if you are. Don't forget video chapters, that little red line, bottom of the screen. Fast forward to any part of the video that sounds interesting and get the hell out of here. Otherwise, follow us on Twitter, Instagram. Get on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to the show. Get on it. Let's get into that first guest conversation. Joining the show tonight, a man who I had the privilege of watching play at the D2 level. Now, though, he's found a new home in the NAIA where he and the Cougars, 7-2 and two this fall, having themselves an absolute time. Coming off another great performance, St. Francis quarterback, Josh Kolka. What's going on, man? Uh, nothing much. Thanks for having me on. Nothing much. Understatement, potentially, of the year. <laughs> Back-to-back wins over top 25 opponents. Marion, which I'm sure we'll talk a lot about tonight. St. Francis, Illinois, close wins, but wins nonetheless. Talk about uh, the momentum of you and the squad down there, dude. Also, shout out the poster over the shoulder. That is epic. I know you framed that perfectly <laughs> for me tonight. Yeah, I got there we go, full screen that thing. Nice. <laughs> that, I love that, dude. Yeah, big Star Wars guy. Big, big Star Wars guy. But, no, it's it's been real special what we've been doing, you know, uh, kind of coming into the season you know obviously everyone has that goal to win the conference make playoffs and stuff and uh you know had had a few slow games in the beginning but it's it feels real good to pick it up against especially two ranked opponents two conference opponents as well so you know we're hoping for it to finish out in these last two is i think it's going to be uh fun be awesome for us 100 percent. and then you know talking about those i mean this past week the franciscan bowl is that what we're mm-hmm. calling it down there yeah yeah i mean Definitely first time I've been hearing it, but no, it's a big rivalry game. You know, it's, it. it was fun. They were taught, they were chippy. We were chippy. It, it's always fun to play in those. No, I, I believe that man. And then going just prepping. I mean, literally before we, we got on the call here, I'm going through Twitter and I see that you guys ranked 22 in the top 25. That's got to be a pretty nice feeling for you guys. The first time this year, I do believe that you've been uh, in that ranked category. Yeah. 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 No, it feels awesome. Got, got the notification right before going to lift tonight. So. Oh yeah. Got, got well, that boys tired. had a little extra juice tonight. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That is good, dude. And now going into these last couple weeks now, before you guys get the results that you want in the ranking, you know, you already had two losses uh, on the schedule and albeit to really quality teams, right? And Indiana Wesleyan, and I believe Taylor was that second one. Was there any sense that you guys almost had your backs against the wall, so to speak, looking at maybe some postseason aspirations of like Hey, this is really, although it might not feel like it, win or go home at this point. If we want to have uh, some of the goals that we set at the beginning of the season, we still want to be able to attain those. It, did, was there any kind of that sense? Oh, yeah. I mean, especially after the Taylor game, I think it was, you know, I mean, our coaches right on the bus said, you know, hey, now now that now that we have two losses, we got to win our conference. It, it's win or go home after this. Like, now every week is your Super Bowl. Every week we prepare like, it, like it's our last week because, you know, it, if we don't win the conference – there's no playoffs. There's no postseason. So 100%. I mean, it was 
it, it, was, it was definitely, you know, it changes how you prepare each week. And I think it's been good. I think it's gotten the boys fired up and, you know, come in each week, like, like I said, like it's our Super Bowl. That's how you got to approach it. That's how you got to approach it. And uh, nearing the end of that of that Marion game, the play that I mean, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about it. The big man touchdown, <laughs> dude. You uh, you come out here and kind of scramble on the on the right side. This ball goes into the end zone, tipped up twice, one by each team, and big man five five just waltzes in in his hands. I mean, talk me through that play. That was ridiculous and also just hilarious. I think equal parts. Yeah, I mean. First off, craziest game I've ever been a part of. Being down 21-0 at first, just seeing the boys fight back was awesome. But no, that play to really tie it up with under two minutes left in the game. I mean, what a what a way to win yeah. it. Especially our center, you know, Jared Almeida. You know, fifth-year guy. You know, he was the one that always was talking to me how big this game was, how much, you know, he hated Mary and how much how big this rivalry was. And then, you know, I scramble, obviously. You know, it's under two minutes. Like I said, it's third and ten. We need a score. And, you know, try to fire it in there to one of my guys and then tipped up twice. You know, usually as a quarterback, your stomach just drops. <laughs> you go, oh, that's a pick for sure. You know, the ball's just floating up there and big fellas just standing there. C- catches it, waltzes in. I, I didn't even know what to do. I didn't know any celebration. I think I just threw my hands up and just yeah. in disbelief. Awesome part, like on the film scene, I think we saw the entire Marion sideline just heads go, just hands go to heads like this. <laughs> Surrender Cobra across yeah, the whole sideline. Like, like nothing you can do, like just the craziest, craziest way to tie up a game in such a big game. And like I said, such a crucial game against a ranked opponent, you know, who was like leading the conference at that point. Just honestly, it was the craziest play I think I've ever seen, been a part of. I believe it. And now you know that offensive line coaches and offensive minded coaches across the country will be using this clip for years, but more in the sense of follow the ball, right? For every offensive mm-hmm. line unit, any skill position, anyone on the field, defensively, they will be saying the same thing. Follow the ball, track to the ball. You never know what's going to happen. Add this to every compilation that uh, every college coach across the country will use uh, for years to come, dude. But I've... Uh, I've heard you talk all about your teammates and some of the the media things and stuff that you've done, and you're great about deflecting from yourself, which is a sign of a a good leader and a good quarterback. But you've got some dudes around you. We'll talk about them. But you personally, right now, fifth in the country for passing touchdowns. you got 29 through nine games. Where does that rank compared to maybe the expectations that you had coming into this season? Um, I think, honestly, like you always expect more out of yourself. You know, and I think, think like like I said, there's always – there's always more I could do, you know, um, stuff coming, you know, kind of feel like a little game behind. Like I didn't play it, start the first game or the second game. So, you know, mm-hmm. I think taking those into account, you know, I'm, I'm glad with where we're at, you know, obviously, like I said, you know, stats, I don't really try to focus on stats. Like if we win games, of course. I'm happy. I could hand, I could hand the ball off hundred plays. And if we're winning, I'm, I'm smiling after, you know, like, like this last game, you know, they get, they let starting to let me call plays more, give me a little more control over the offense. I think okay. I called five straight run plays and we, and we scored like, I mean, like I said, like the stats are great. And like I said, we have a great old line, great receivers. So it makes it really easy. Just, you know, throw the ball to them, let them make plays. But it's, I mean, it's, it's been, it's been awesome. You know, winning player of the week and stuff has been awesome. But like, like I, like I always try to do, I, I really believe like, my old line's great, giving me a lot of time, you know. I could throw it deep, so if our guys will beat them so- at some point, I can just throw it as far as I can. They will, and they, you guys have proven that uh, quite a few times this year. Vickers on the outside has been kind of your go-to. What separates mm-hmm. him as a wide receiver from maybe some of the guys that you've played with or competed against this year and in the past? Uh, I think just a big ball magnet, to be honest. Like, I, I think he's a great guy on the outside, big body, great hands, great, you know, great guy to go up and just kind of catch it in traffic you know I think you know he's my roommate actually the there you go shout out right now so but yeah no he's he's been awesome you know he's a big reason why I came here actually before he came here I hosted him on a visit at Wayne no way and then we had stayed yeah so we had actually stayed connected through there and then one of the big reasons I came here is because I I'd stay connected with him through all that so you know just kind of that connection and just like just a just a great athlete and I, you know, I, I think you can do some amazing things. That's a really neat story. You don't, you're probably not going to hear a lot of, uh, a lot of those ones, but uh, you know, now to the backfield, two seniors and Smith and Bennett who have been splitting the load a lot for you guys, seemingly offensively. What have you uh, seen from that tandem? Uh, I mean, especially in these last few games, I think, I think it's, I think they've been playing awesome. 
you know, especially with behind our old line and stuff. I think, I think those guys have really, really separated themselves. Like, and our run game has really been more distinctive in these last few games. And I think that's what's kind of put us over the top. You know, I think, I think we got away from the run a little bit in the early, early on in the season. I think now that we kind of, we're firing in all cylinders on offense. I think that's awesome. You know, I think they've been doing awesome. Lenny just had a great game. I think he had 112 mm-hmm. yards rushing last game and a touchdown and Smitty had another touchdown. Like, I think it's just I think it's awesome when you get the guys going on the ground because it's tough to stop when you when you're getting four yards of four yards of pop, no no one can stop you there. You do it and then you bring in a fresh set of legs that does it all over again and that's a that's a really good piece of what you guys have going on and you've talked about getting a lot of guys incorporated in this offense whether it is in the offensive backfield whether it's on the outside and mm-hmm. it feels like the depth of the offense especially at the skill positions is starting to be kind of the differentiating factor in some of these games how have you seen that grow kind of throughout the season some of those guys step into some bigger roles so to speak uh yeah i mean like at the receiver spot even even at running back you know like Guys like Drew Wheat, Walsh, like Ryan Walsh getting getting reps at running back. And then we got, you know, receivers like now we're rotating them all the time because we want to start going fast pace. I think it I think it's just it makes us like you said, it separates us because we have it doesn't matter who's in the game, who you try to stop, we'll just go somewhere else. You know, we have guys, yep. we have playmakers all over the field that it doesn't matter who's in the game, they're gonna be able to make a play. Like doesn't matter, you can stack the box, we'll throw it outside, you know, bring guys outside. You know, we'll run it. We'll run it right up the gut. I think that's that's just what makes I think our offense so versatile and you know so so you know awesome at times. From what I've seen, I would 100% tend to agree with that one. Now, two weeks to go, big time home game coming up this weekend. SXU. What have you seen from the Cougars that you got to prepare for? Um, I mean, honestly, let, I think I think it goes just go back to what I always say. Like, I think it really depends on us. Like, if we're we're firing all cylinders like this is going to be a real like like you said every week now is it's winter go home now we got to mm-hmm. win the conference to even have a chance to make the playoffs and we got we got to we got to win out so i mean they're they're four and four but no no way overlooking them they have been a great yeah. team has a lot of close games and like i said but like i said i think it ultimately comes down to us and i think that's what every game honestly comes down to i like when i i think personally when when we're firing all cylinders and we're doing we're playing our best ball I don't think anyone can stop our offense, you know? So I think that's kind of what it comes down to. Like I said, like, we're going to, we're going to figure out, you know, where, what you're trying to stop and we'll just do, do the other thing. That uh, you might have to make some more space on the wall next to Vader for that quote and just throw it like right above, above the window right there. (laughs) I like that a lot, dude, but that's all I got for you, Josh. Really appreciate your time. Excited to, uh, you know, I'm hip to you guys now. Excited to follow you the rest of the way, man, and, and keep seeing this offense and this team as a whole just grow, man. Of course, you know, hopefully we'll be playing in December. I would like that. I would like that a lot. So thank you, Josh. Have a good rest of your night, my man. Of course. You too. Thank you so much for having me on. Big thank you to Josh for joining the show. Now, though, we'll switch gears. D2 football, the bread and butter of today's episode. We'll get to the upsets. We'll get to the highlights. We'll get to all those things. But first, we got to take a look at these. The first released Super Region rankings from the NCAA, starting off with Super Region number one. Atop that list, the two undefeated teams I mentioned in the opener, Charleston, Kutztown. Then you go down some other PSAC foes in California, Slippery Rock. Number five is Ashland at the 7-2 record. You've got East Stroudsburg and Finley rounding out that top seven. Just on the outside looking in, you have New Haven, Tiffin, and Assumption. So, any surprises here that I can think of? Ashland maybe being this high up above teams like ESU and Finley with an 8-1 record? Potentially, you look at the strength of schedule from Ashland, though, and the Eagles and what they've put up with this year, it may be not so surprising. I think New Haven with, and I'm not going to be the one to tell you about the new kind of ruling, those things, not like, I definitely don't consider myself a bracket expert, but they do have a new deal in D2 football with this earned access type of deal of uh, winning the conference and then being on kind of the outside looking in, so... I have to figure out exactly what the hell the details are on that, but it sounds like New Haven, even if they're on the outside, will actually take the place of a Finley in this case scenario or kind of the last one in in the super region depending on you know conference representation and how that plays out but again not too many surprises in super region number one we get down to super region number two though things get a little interesting Wingate at number one in super region number two followed by West Alabama at number two and finally the undefeated Valdosta State squad 
at number three in Super Region number two. And that's where, like I said, things start to get very interesting. Now, obviously, Wingate, two wins against top-ranked opponents. West Alabama has done much in the same. Valdosta doesn't have the same kind of strength of schedule, but again, their record is unblemished at 8-0. and oh. For them to be at the three... Still some football to be played, admittedly, but that's kind of ridiculous to me. Johnson C. Smith, even after kind of a blowout loss this last week to Fayetteville State, still coming in at number four. Then you've got a Carson Newman team that's been pretty hot at number five. Virginia Union with some more representation there. And uh, number seven, Winston-Salem State. They get the nod ahead of Lenore Ryan. That right there, that blew my mind. I, I really... <laughs> I really don't understand that. I mean, I can't wrap my head around it. Lenore Ryan, one of those two losses being to Wingate, who is the number one team, so to speak, in Super Region 2 right now. I, I cannot really understand how they are on the outside looking in of Super Region 2. Finally, Miles in West Florida at 9 and 10, respectively. But that's an interesting mix right there. And uh, like I said, we still got a couple weeks before this totally shakes out. But this is where we start to get the picture of what this playoff could ultimately look like. Super Region 3, obviously the most stacked probably of all these different regions. But again, not one team in this region that does not have a loss in their record. That's a pretty uncommon feat. Ferris State up first. They are a sole loss on the year. Still good enough to be number one. Grand Valley State, who lost only to Ferris, right behind them. Pittsburgh State, who beat that Ferris State squad in week zero. They're right there with that second loss. Um, still ranked number three because of that strength of schedule and some other factors. Central Oklahoma, also out of the MIAA, right there behind the Gorillas. Then you've got Wachita Baptist, ranked right above Harding, five and six respectively. Some GAC representation even after the loss of Southern Nazarene. So it'd be interesting to see if Wachita had not lost last week to Southern Nazarene, you could only imagine, would they be the number one? I feel like one to five is kind of a, a tall drop-off, but I'm not really sure how they would have handled that. So Wachita falls to number five, still very much in the picture when it comes to the playoffs here. Harding at number six with that sole loss to the Tigers. And then finally at number seven, Emporia State. Some more MIAA action. Now you've got Saginaw on the outside looking in at 7-2 and two in the 8th spot. 9 is U-Indy and 10 is Southern Arkansas. U-Indy is very much in the same boat as New Haven, if I'm understanding that correctly, in that this earned access type deal of conference representation in that they might get the nod, or they will get the nod, as opposed to, in this case, an Emporia State. I'll have to do my research and figure out exactly how that works. I'm sorry, I, just, I talk about football, I don't talk about bracketology. This really isn't like... The way the brackets are created, I, yeah, I've got my frustrations with it, but I don't nearly understand the algorithms and things. i got to get into the dirt maybe a little bit more there. Finally, though, Super Region number four. Colorado State University Pueblo comes in at the top spot. They've taken over the RMAC. They had a commanding win against the number four team on this list in Western Colorado this week. We'll talk about it later in the episode here. Augustana, the top team from the NSIC, showing up there in the second spot, followed closely behind by Mankato. And then you go down with some Lone Star squads in Angelo State and Central Washington at number five and number six. Finally, Sioux Falls from the NSIC. Kind of a, an interesting team right there in at number seven. Western Oregon very much still having a great chance sitting at six and one. And you might be wondering, this is week nine that we're talking about. A week nine recap. Why is Western Oregon six and one? That's only seven games. They played two games against Division I opponents. And those do not count. See the overall Division II record. Those do not count, um, you know, going to that record. So that's why Western Oregon is only at 6-1. and one. And you got Mesa and Colorado School of Mines all the way down at the 10 spot is something that we certainly are not familiar with, at least in the recent history of Division II football. Mines has uh, certainly dropped off a little bit. Still very much a prominent team. And still, you know, depending on how some things shake out, could be on one of those those kind of last spots and we get one of those last bids into the playoff. But uh, that is kind of the look right now at the Division II playoff. If the games and everything were to just be all canceled and we had to start the playoff today, that would be your field. I'd be very curious for you guys to let me know uh, what teams you think are being absolutely snubbed and maybe what teams are ranked way too high. You know, this team does not deserve X, Y, and Z. Let me know. Talk about it. Um, but... We'll keep moving on because it is what it is. I don't really have a, a say in the matter. Hopefully, you all know that. But let's talk about our players of the week at the D2 level. Starting things off in the PSAC, East Stroudsburg, John Siggins, eight catches, 246 yards, and four tuds. 
against Shippensburg this week. I believe it was Shippensburg. What a performance. Their quarterback had a great day as well, and just the offense in general. I mean, this was almost his stat line through a half, if that puts it into perspective. He almost completed this this whole entire stat line in one half of football. I think that in of itself is absolutely ridiculous. We'll go back here. We've got our special teams player of the week. From the Broncos, Kobe Stevens, defensive back from Central Oklahoma. Four returns, 149 yards, and a touchdown. But his one return, I believe, from correct, went for 94 yards. That is the longest punt return touchdown of any NCAA player this season, regardless of division. We thought that earned him the nod. Also, in that game, that ended up being a very pivotal point that allowed him to come back and hit a game winner uh, against, I believe it was Missouri Western. So, pivotal timing, big-time play from Another Kobe. So from one Kobe to another, kudos to you, my friend. Finally, so many good stat lines for Defensive Player of the Week. We had to pick two. The first of which is Darian Dunlap-Johnson, the defensive back from Harding. He had four tackles, but he had three interceptions. Three interceptions in their win on Saturday. That, that is uh, earned Defensive Player of the Week honors for him. And then you go on to the other side of things. Colin Sturr from Colorado Mesa, the linebacker, had 10 tackles in the day. Three and a half of them taking on the quarterback from behind the line of scrimmage. Four and a half TFLs, and then he did punch the ball out. Forced a fumble in Mesa's win over, uh, I believe that was Black Hills State. That, again, there were so many other good ones too. Excuse me. And I'm going to do my best to try and highlight some of those other performances throughout the week. So definitely stay tuned on the socials for that. But we did have to highlight those performances before we got going with uh, just about anything else on today's episode. But let's get into some of the recaps from this last week. And admittedly, we're not going to talk too much about this Wachita Southern Nazarene game just because I've got Dalen coming on the show later. So I don't want to, you know, beat a dead horse with it, but we got to talk. We have to talk about this game. Southern Nazarene in our game of the week, they pull out the 18 to 17 win over Wachita Baptist. Here's the touchdown from our guy, Lunging over the goal line to put in what would actually be the only offensive touchdown, the only touchdown in general for this Storm squad on the day. They had three field goals, one in each quarter leading up to that. And then finally able to punch one in. That being the Hail Mary attempt from Wachita that was unsuccessful. It seals the deal for Southern Nazarene. They get their 100th win in the history of their program. Their first program win over Wachita on Halloween night. I mean, this game was absolutely incredible. And again, I'm not going to talk too much about it because we got Dalen coming on the show later on, but wanted to show some of the tape here and just really let you know how big of a win this was for uh, this Southern Nazarene team. And to highlight some individual performances, Dalen Smith actually led the team in receiving yards, four catches and 52 yards rushing-wise. Uh, Bryson Evans did a lot for Southern Nazarene in the air and on the ground. He finished with 70 yards on the ground and 176 through the air. Did have one interception, um, but otherwise was was rather efficient on the day. Wachita. Much in the same kind of their similar offense, but they had two interceptions, two takeaways through the air for Southern Nazarene that stuffed and stimmied some of those uh, those drives for Wachita. Seth Spruill, hopefully pronouncing that one correctly, and then Adrian Melvin, two guys taking the ball out of the air for Southern Nazarene on the defensive front. So, again, we're going to have Daniel on. We'll talk all about that game, but let's keep it moving forward. And I guess my one cliff note on this, Wachita Baptist, they beat Harding just a week, a week two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, they beat Harding. Southern Nazarene lost to Harding 59 to nothing to open the season this year. And they just went and beat what I mean. How? What a what a great example of like for all you out there, quit playing the who beat who game. It's terrible. This should be this should put it to bed for good. Um, but I mentioned that this was the third week in a row that the number one team of the country has been taken down and who else to do it this week than the Mules from Central Missouri? We're going to roll the tape here and take a look at this one. They go into the jungle and pull off a win over the number one team in the country. Pittsburgh State heading into this game, giving up less than 100 rushing yards per game. UCM, they come in, they run for 225. I think that right there is a the stat of the game. The Gorillas are built in the line of scrimmage. They are absolutely suffocating defensively at doing just that. And uh, this time, though, was the Mules' defense. And their defensive line, you see it right here. Dotson goes down early, and that was kind of uh, a precursor 
for what was to come from this Mules defense. How about that uni combo, by the way? The black helmets with the white jerseys, usually not something I think I could get behind. But uh, in this case, I absolutely love it. Got a little bit of a tush push, brotherly shove to get things going. For the Mules, they were quiet in the first quarter. Scored 24 in the second. So they were up 24-10 going into halftime. Zach Zabrowski, the man under center right there, he had himself a day for Central Missouri. 22 for 31 through the air, 382 yards, two touchdowns. Did have one interception, but I think another impressive piece of his game, 96 yards on the ground. Zabrowski was getting it, Zabrowski, excuse me, was getting it done with his feet. Here's a deep ball that would go in for a score. Just one of the many... On the day, I think of that one, the first one being to Michael Fitzgerald, that was a 62-yarder to put them up 17-10. to 10. You see the energy there. Inside of, again, what is a very hostile environment over there in the jungle? This is a very tough place to play, and we talked about this game a little bit last week. We thought that maybe this game coming into the year would have some MIAA championship implications. It looks like it still might, but not in the way that we thought. We thought this game was going to be whoever wins is the champion. That certainly uh, doesn't look like it's going to be the case, but for Pittsburgh State does kind of knock them out of that contention potentially for an MIAA conference title. But those are the big cliff notes from this. About 8,000 people in attendance in Carney Smith. You see Zabrowski here, great example of him getting it done with his feet, a little stiff arm off the outside, try to spin move, get close to the goal line. They finish on that drive and uh, outscored Pittsburgh State 10 nothing Defense pitches a shutout in the fourth quarter for the Mules. And uh, that was all she wrote for this, uh, this Pittsburgh State team. So their second loss on the year, for Pitt State, still very much in the thick of it. Still very much in contention, but a tough loss nonetheless at home. Wow. Let's keep going. Another ranked victory. Another ranked upset, if you will. This Wingate squad, who now apparently has earned themselves the number one spot in their super region heading into the playoffs. They just took down what I believe is a very talented Lenore Ryan squad, handing them their second loss of the season Take a look at this one. Wingate going into number 12, Lenora Ryan. Shout out to WBTV for these clips and these cut-ups. That's kind of the name of the game right there for this Wingate squad. They got on them early. They got on them often. And uh, you look at this. They're up 14-0 going into the half. Defense with a perfect first half. Just about, it would seem. And a couple of the scores here from Wingate. Uh, Barnett or O'Brien Barnett and you got Evan McCray. Excuse me, with those two touchdowns in the first half for the Bulldogs. And, you know, Lenore Ryan would try and fight things back in the second half here. That was uh, Jalen Ferguson run in for a touchdown. But Wingate defensively, a little bit too much, too late. They pull off the win on the road at Wingate, which, again, a very tough spot to play. They call it in between the bricks over there. The Bulldogs certainly comfortable in that environment. That is the third straight win for them in this matchup between uh, Bulldogs and Bears. Individual performances, though. Brooks Bentley for Wingate, 23 of 38, 248, and a touchdown through the air. Did have an interception. Wingate did not get a whole lot done on the ground, but uh, Evan McCray, I talked about him, he had the one score in the first half there. 10 catches, 140 yards, and a touchdown for him on the day. A very great performance. You had Brandon Perry with the takeaway and interception for that Wingate defense, and then six different Wingate defenders getting into the backfield for TFLs on the day. Certainly feels like a really good moment for this Wingate squad, who's got, uh, you know, just a few games left. You look at the schedule for this Wingate team moving forward, and it's just Newberry. That's all you've got. On November 9th, this coming weekend, they play Newberry, and then you would imagine we'll be playing in the SAC championship game the following week. A lot of things going on down there in the sack. So let's keep moving. Back up to the MIAA for this one, though, and... Number 13, Central Oklahoma at Missouri Western. This one did not necessarily go the way that uh, I think a lot of people imagined it. Going into halftime, this game was 14-7 to in favor of UCO. But then the Griffins come out and have quite the production in the second half. They score 27 in the second half. Forced this thing into overtime on a... Well, I shouldn't even say they forced it. They were leading almost all the way till the end. And you have a team, they're up 34 to 20 in the fourth quarter. About five minutes left, they scored. And uh, uh, off the interception, I should say. Then Kobe Stevens, we talked about him earlier. That's when he had the big time punt return. 92 yards, said 94 earlier. 92 yard punt return 
for Kobe Stevens. That got it to 27-34. And then Dawson Hurl for UCO. He scores on a one-yard touchdown run with 13 seconds left. The extra point from Nicky Quevedo. Uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that one correctly. That's good. 34-34. We're going to overtime. And in overtime, the game winner here. A career-long 47 yards for the Bronchos. Off the foot of Quivero. Flag on the play was not on UCO. He nails it. The boys love it. That is how you win an overtime football game in the MIAA. Take one more look at that kick right there. 37-34, UCO takes this one to keep what has been an incredible season for them alive. And if you're a team like this, you have to eke out a couple of these kind of wins, these gritty wins that maybe, all things considered, should not have been this close. Again, Missouri Western, a very competent opponent, not trying to put them down. But now, if you're UCO, you have to have a couple of those wins, right? We, you've seen it there. You saw it uh, a little bit earlier in the season, but they've had some really demanding wins too. How about that win over Central Missouri earlier on? Um, and that win against Northwest Missouri State at home. Like you've talked about uh, at home against Fort Hayes State where they dominate. There's a lot of wins where they've really come out and dominated. You're going to have at least one of these throughout the course of the season that you just have to get by and survive. They did that. They got the result. Now they're at Washburn and then back at home versus Emporia State. Very much in the driver's seat for the MIAA right now. We'll see if they can close things off with a conference title. Keep things going. Johnson C. Smith, we've talked quite a bit about them, at least, all things considered, because not usually a team we mention on the national stage, unbeaten, no more, undefeated, no more, Fayetteville State, 27 to nothing. They kind of thrash the Golden Bulls in this one, 14 to nothing at the half. And uh, when you look at the stats, kind of the breakdown in this one, JCSU finished with 30 yards rushing. Net, I should say, on the day. 30 yards net rushing and only 192 of total offense. This Bronco defense absolutely stepped up in some very big ways. You also look at seven penalties for 104 yards. You can't do that in this kind of game. You look at some other deals with, uh, you know, interceptions. A couple of those through the air. You lose the time of possession battle by a large margin. And it really all starts to add up for this JCSU team. It is not their day. Fayetteville State comes in and does a really good job defensively, but their offense certainly shined too. Joe Owens Jr., 26-34, 213 and a touchdown through the air. They didn't have a whole lot going on the rushing attack either, but uh, Harris Strayer, 9 catches, 117 yards, was their best performance receiving-wise through the air for the Broncos. You had three different guys back there for sacks. You had uh, Elijah Casey with an interception return, 47 yards. That was the final score for the Broncos to really put the exclamation point on it, the nail in the coffin, if you will, for this uh, JCSU team. And now Fayetteville State, don't get me wrong, their season is not necessarily going anywhere. They're 4-4. Four and four. They're, they're not really uh, in a position where they're going to be making a postseason run. But this may have derailed some of that momentum that uh, – the Golden Bulls had going on for them. You look here at their football schedule and what they have the rest of the season here. Let me pull that up real quick. Because they're still very much in the playoff contention. But now, to close out the year, you're at Livingstone, and then you have the CIAA championship game, which I would imagine would be against like a Virginia Union-type squad who they already beat previously in the season inside a conference play. You never know. Uh, they already have quality wins over Winston-Salem, Virginia Union, two of those teams that were in those regional rankings. So not to say this the, the year's over for the Golden Bulls after one loss, because it certainly is not. You would expect them to get a good result at Livingstone this coming week. But uh, that CIAA championship now is going to have a lot of meaning behind it for both squads involved, potentially. Especially when it comes to home field. Right? You get home field status after a big win like that in the playoffs. That's going to be a big-time motivator. Let's go over to the RMAC, though. Western Colorado hosting CSU Pueblo. 
The Thunderwolves win it 44 to 34, and this really was a game for the entire RMAC. And both these teams now sitting at eight and one. This was the differentiator as far as the conference standings go. Both quarterbacks having an absolute day. Roman Fuller for CSP, he had 30. He was 31 for 43. 381 and four touchdowns. You look on the other side of things for the Mountaineers, Drew Nash, 29 of 50, 405 and four touchdowns through the air. Just an absolute day. The difference, I think, was the ground game here. 40 yards for Western Colorado compared to the almost 160 of CSP. Many of those coming off the back of Howard Russell. 19 carries, 159 yards with a long of 75. But again, both these offenses absolutely showing out. We've talked a bit about the Western Colorado defense, that defensive backfield they have over there for the Mountaineers, that linebacker core that, uh, you know, don't let the stats fool you. Still played a solid game against a very high-powered CSU Pueblo attack. But this CSUP team, I mean, you talk about five different sacks on the day. You had an interception off the hands of Cotton Rulo. Like, these are some big-time plays that are going to be differentiators in a game like that. The defense from Western Colorado was simply not playing at that same caliber when it came to kind of the the big-time drive-ending type of plays. Again, the rushing battle, very much in favor of CSU Pueblo. And you also had a lot of penalties in this one. 22 penalties combined for both teams. That's a ridiculous number that I was not aware of until right now. Holy... Uh, both teams perfect in the red zone. Red zone. Red zone. The red zone as far as scoring chances, six of six and three of three respectively. But uh, yeah, now you look at the CSU Pueblo squad, who really owns the RMAC, and uh, coming up this next week is the big one. They're back at home versus number eighteen or number twenty, depending on how you look at it. Colorado Mines. Does Colorado Mines have any fight left in them? They're on the outside looking in right now. The regional rankings, the super region for the playoff picture, CSUP, certainly that would be a statement win for them on senior day to go out and roll over the ore diggers. We will see. Then they are at Chadron State to close out the year. But really, this one is going to determine it all in the Thunder Bowl. Can the Thunder Wolves take down the ore diggers? And will that be the, so to speak, passing of the torch over in the RMAC, the next team to come up and really take control of the conference over there? I mean... You go back-to-back -back Western and Mines. If they can win both of those, that is going to be pretty incredible. Their one loss on the season was at GVSU, a 21-24 ball game. This team has played some really great football throughout the course of the year. It's no surprise they're ranked as highly as they are when it comes to the Super Region and those kind of rankings. To take a look at some of the, at least a little bit of the footage from this one here, uh, one guy that did have himself a day, Reggie Retzlaff, who continues to be an absolute animal on the outside for this CSUP squad. And uh, you look at this catch right here. I'm going to let it play a couple times. This dude is a monster. He is a threat to anyone trying to play man coverage, especially you get down into the red zone. Take a look at it one more time. Top left part of your screen. No fancy move. No gimmicks. I am stronger than you, I am better than you, and I'm going to catch this ball over the top of you with one hand as an added little asterisk there. One more time, take a look at this one. Um, just a ridiculous, ridiculous play in the fourth quarter. That was kind of an exclamation point. Um, already up 10 points. You go ahead and get that score. But uh, how about them Thunderwolves, man? Playing a lot of really good ball right now. We'll close things off here on the highlight side with some Lone Star Conference action. Number 17, Central Washington going over and playing at Angelo State. This game, certainly a lot to determine in terms of LSC play. Angelo, uh, they have two losses on the year already, but they're both out of conference. Fort Hayes State and Emporia State. They started the year 0-2. They have not lost since coming into this game. Well... They remained undefeated inside of Lone Star Conference play. Got some clips here from our post with Flow Football as we go through and take a look at some of what they had going on here. The Rams early on across the middle. How about this deep ball getting things going? That is Zeke Freeman, 75-yard touchdown pass from Braden Fuller that got the Rams on the board early in the first quarter. I mean early, like first play, first possession early in the game. So that's the way you want to start things off for the Rams. Um, Central Washington would respond at the end of the first quarter. They had a field goal uh, to make it 7-3 to three at the end of the first, but you keep things going here for the Rams. Now it's 10-10. 
How about Fuller keeping it himself up the left side, breaking a few tackles? He did a lot of that on the night. This time, he breaks even more right down to the one-yard line. Jaden Jones would end up closing the deal on that drive with a one-yard touchdown run to close it off in the second half. And uh, really, Central Washington did make a play to uh, go for kind of the the tie, so to speak, in the fourth. Oh, here's the touchdown there from Jaden that I had mentioned previously. Central Washington, they score in the fourth quarter. It's 16 to 17. They elect to go for one and tie it up, not go for two in the win, but just to tie it up and go for one. Take one more look at this clip right here. That kick, wide left, and Angelo State takes this one. 17 to 16, the Rams win over the Wildcats. What a terrible way to lose this game if you are Central Washington. That hurts really bad. I can't tell from that clip necessarily if someone got a hand on it or something along those lines. It kind of happens too quickly for me to really understand. But you see the celebration right there from that Ram sideline. Here's one more look at it. It doesn't look like it really got, I don't know, I can't even tell. But what a gut-wrenching way to lose a game you know, of this magnitude. And now this Angelo State team very much in the driver's seat of the Lone Star Conference. Their biggest game of the year in conference play coming up this weekend at Western Oregon, who also has played very well inside of LSC play, and they close out the year against West Texas A&M. So not saying it's all wrapped up and tied in a bow for this Angelo State squad, but if they take care of business like they're supposed to, they should be your Lone Star Conference champions this year. We will see if they're able to do just that. Some other quick hitters, though, from around the country. Edinburgh, they outlast Seton Hill at home. 24-22. The Edinburgh defense, they forced three turnovers. The offense rushed for over near, uh, nearly 200 yards in uh, the big-time win there for the Scots. Bloomsburg, they beat Shepard in double overtime, 27-21. Huskies' first road win over the Rams since 2006. Hello. West Texas A&M, to go back to the Lone Star, they took down Texas A&M Kingsville, 21-14. Buffaloes, they'd scored 14 unanswered in the fourth quarter. West Texas gearing up to, you know, maybe make some noise and take out a team like Angelo in the last week of conference play. We shall see. But that's really it from the, the D2 football scene. As uh, Buzz, you want to make an appearance here, buddy? Hey. You coming up? Here, buddy. Hey, come on. Come on. There he is. <laughs> you got anything to say, pal? <laughs> but that is that is all from the D2 football scene from myself and Buzz. We will go over to our next guest conversation and then wrap things up with some D3 and NAIA football talk. Joining the show tonight, he scored the touchdown, heard around the world this week. As Southern Nazarene upset the number three Tigers from Washita Baptist, it's tight end, Dalen Smith. Dude, hey, man. what a week for you guys. What a week for you. This has had to be a, a really exciting kind of uh, journey that you're on right now. And it's I'm sure you probably can't appreciate all of it right now because you're still in the thick of it. And you know, obviously, I'm sure at some point throughout the episode, I'll, I'll get a great line from you of, you know, got to move on from this game, on to the next one. And you're supposed to say those things, by the way. But um, talk about, before we get into the play itself, talk about the nationwide reaction, it seems like, from that massive win on Thursday, dude. It, uh, it was awesome. I mean, immediately following the game, get in the locker room, we were kind of talking about it even today, just the, the outpouring of alumni and the freshmen that didn't get to travel and just you know, everybody's blowing up your phone. So it was really cool to just to get on the phone with some of them guys and, and see their reactions and, and get some of that love from just from guys within the program or that have been in the program and before you even get out to even just the nationwide stuff. I mean, we obviously, we, is, we knew it was a big-time game, so some of that stuff would be coming, but really the, the awesome stuff was just see the guys like celebrating on campus, the videos that we got from that. And so that was really cool. That is always really cool. You talk about the guys, maybe that didn't suit up and, and make it to that trip, but obviously we're still tuned in and, and locked in. Um, and also you get to stick it to the bunch of people like myself that maybe forgot you guys were playing on a Thursday night on a Halloween type of night. Um, there were quite a few of them out there. And I think when, when that final score goes out, you surprised a lot of people for a couple reasons. One, because you just went and upset this, what people thought maybe was a national powerhouse. And two, why the hell are they playing on Halloween? So there were these two different pieces. Um, but let's talk about, I mean, the play in particular, right? We're, we're getting down to it right near the end of the game. You guys haven't been able to, to punch it in throughout this one. You've been able to put points on the board. But finally, tight end screen or whatever variation your verbiage of that is called in the huddle, you 
have to go to the line of scrimmage and sell this block knowing the ball is going to be coming your way and, and really the fate of the game is going to be somewhat in your hands. Talk to me just pre-snap those moments, trying to keep it together, not give the defense any tells of what's going on. Well, really, it starts just leading up to that whole drive. We, we've been, I mean, incredible drive, the best drive of the game, and it comes just at the perfect time. Made some really big plays. There's other guys that really set it up. And, and uh, I mean, the dude in front of me is incredible DN and great pass rusher. And he had actually beat me on a couple other ones, just kind of sprinting away that he he's really eager and really thought he was going to run that down. And so, really, I had no problem. I knew – for sure that I was going to sell it to this dude that yeah. he was going to get by me. And and so it was just the, the rest of it and how that was going to play out. I like that answer. I like that answer. That's how you, uh, that's how you want to feel in one of those moments. And so now, you know, you get the ball in your hands, you turn up field, not only you've got a couple blockers in front of you, you got green grass. And I just, I mean, do you black out in that moment? Because that, that's that got to feel like, you know, I, I know as someone who comes out of the backfield, maybe catches the ball, you're expecting to maybe get hit right away, right? Someone read the hell out of this from the jump. Uh, what's that feeling getting the ball in your hands and going for the for the pylon for the end zone? Uh, yeah, I mean, he's turned around and I, I see two white jerseys in front of me and, and took off and I tell everybody back and you kind of have that picture that diving across the goal line and Really, when I dove, I got back to the sideline. I was like, I don't even know why I dove. I felt like I was four yards in the end zone. Like, I knew for <laughs> sure I was in. And so I was like, I hope I didn't look too goofy. But, uh, no, we, we've run that play before, and our O-line does a great job getting out on screens. And you see both of them guys getting out of our tackles working on that corner. And mm -hmm. and the other guy to have the awareness to turn around and pick the guy up that was about to, to tackle me. But, yeah, no, so it, I had a lot of confidence turning around. I mean, we've run that play several times before, and, and they've even – I mean, there was several formations we lined up in, and, and them guys, even on Thursday night, were, they hey, watch tight end screen because it, it is a chunk play for us several times yeah. throughout the season. They're calling it out pre-snap, but obviously there were there were no pre-snap callouts on this one, I imagine. Yeah, and that's and that's our coach talked about all the time. The glory of our offense, we can just challenge guys formationally, lots of formations, lots of motions, and and so we we can run things a lot of different ways and and make it hard for the defense. 100%, man. Now, is it hard in that moment that, you know, the game for all intents and purposes is just about over, but there are still just under 30 seconds left on the clock. Is it hard not to celebrate the way that you guys want to in that moment, knowing what you're on the cusp of or, uh, you know, trying to get the guys locked in? Hey, first of all, we're trying to go for two, which you guys were unsuccessful on, but try to get the two-point conversion, give us the three-point lead, and then, okay, we got to field the kickoff and then, you know, stop them ultimately from a Hail Mary or some type of long field goal attempt. Was it hard to kind of put those emotions down in the moment? Uh, Yeah, it definitely was. It was, uh, like you said, we run the two-point, kind of had a little scare there, but we get them down, so it's no big deal. And then it's uh, just hurry up and wait. You know, you can't, can't run that time off fast enough. So just getting over there and, and really waiting until the last second because the week before, you know, we get beat with the walk-off from 54 yards. We know they have a great kicker. And yep. so it's just it's – just, you get over the sideline and you're watching your defense go play lights out for another one last drive. And so, yeah, definitely just that's, hurry up and wait. That's some kind of feeling. Hurry up and wait is a great way to describe it. I love that. And it's some kind of feeling, too, um, from a guy that just made one of the biggest plays of the year, the biggest play of the year uh, probably for this team. Then you got to go on the sideline and it feels like it's totally out of your control, right? And that's such a – what a football moment. But that's when you got to trust the guys, you know, on the other side of the ball to do their thing. Now, a lot of teams – would lose faith after starting 0-8. And, and working up here at, at Northern, we got a team right now that is struggling. And it is hard to get guys to buy in each and every week when you're playing some of the top teams in the country. And not only that, going on the road against a top five opponent, if you had to quantify it, what is it about this team that you guys have been able to keep the buy in, even after some of those those struggles early on, to to make them believe that something and a result like this was possible? It it really starts Several years ago, you know, our program's relatively new for D2, and mm -hmm. we've had our ups and downs. We had a great season last year, but ever since uh, hey, Coach Hayes has come in, it's been, are you willing to fight re regardless of score or circumstance? And that's been the deal for the past several years. And so even before this year, the the 0 and 8 or whatever you are, it's it's uh, in every game. If, if you're getting blown out, like, are you going to come out and fight these dudes? And so I think that's just – kind of the, the culture we've kind of been building around here for the last several years and the dudes. And I know it's a big deal in fall camp every year. It's a, hey, if you're not one of these guys, then, then you're not, you're not part of it. So, and that's something that's preached 
every year, all year long, it's one of our big, big things is, are you willing to come out and, and fight regardless of score circumstance? And so I just think that really kind of prevailed on that night. So. No, that's really good. And that's, that's easier said than done. Right. And for you guys yeah, to go out and absolutely. exemplify that is, is really good. And I, I like that, you know, no matter score or circumstance, I like that a lot, right. No matter all the other things, again, outside of your control, potentially, um, you know, how are you going to go out there and represent yourself and, and your team? And you talk about your program being, in the grand scheme of things, a pretty young one. Your first win over Watchtown in program history, a hundredth program win for uh, SNU. Some would say that is a scary coincidence on a night yeah, like that. Just as the, as the night went on, we just keep getting more of these, oh, it was the first program win. Oh, it was the hundredth program win. Oh, it was. Yep. And so it was just really cool to keep hearing all that and hearing how just much we got to advance the program in that in that one win. A hundred percent. And before, you know, we got recording, you had talked about how, you know, the buzz started to pick up on Thursday night. And as people realized that this was really going to be a game that maybe a lot of people didn't expect, more people started showing up during. Was that like a halftime? We had like a, another kind of group that came into the stadium. Talk to me about how, how that how that went. Yeah, I don't know. I can't remember if it was at halftime when we came out or, or in between third and fourth yeah. quarter or whatever, we had uh, some of the Henderson guys coming over there right across the street. They were down there. They were celebrating every play with us down there, dang near on the sideline. And, <laughs> That's awesome. and so uh, our fan base kept growing, even though we weren't having Oklahoma people drive out overnight yeah. or over, over the course of the game. So it was, it was pretty cool to see all them guys down there and, and see if, if we were attracting them guys to get out there and come watch. That's pretty cool. Celebrating white with you. That is uh that's a unique that's a unique deal. And now you guys back home, you've got it looked like homecoming and senior day this weekend. Yes. Hell yeah. Let's That'd go, man. One. In front of what I hope will be kind of a packed crowd from the jump of things. You get a lot of people, you talk about those alumni and other people involved with the program that now maybe just have that one more reason to come out and support you guys uh this weekend. Talk to me about uh this weekend's game. What do you gotta do to, to get the job done yet again? Uh just I mean, same things as we've been doing. We've been playing, we've been talking about it all year, just effort and, and things like that and physicality, just being super physical and, and playing with all of our effort and then just playing pretty good football on top of that, not not turning over the ball and, and limiting penalties. So offensively, that's that's our big deal. And then our defense just, man, they've been, I know like scores and stats, you look at it, it just doesn't show how, how great them dudes have been playing. They, yeah. Our defense has been playing lights out, and so offensively just limiting turnovers and penalties. No matter score or circumstance, my friend. But I will, uh, I'll let you get to a, a late practice tonight, it sounds like. I really appreciate you uh, taking a little bit of time out of your day, my man. Exciting week for you guys, and uh, shoot, let's, let's build on this, huh? Absolutely. Finish awesome. out. Yeah. Dalen, thank you very much, man. Have a good night. Awesome. Thank you. D3 football where our conversation usually starts and ends in the WIAC. Jimmy Martin back with us. We're going to get through some, some D3 games tonight, and the first of which being number 21, River Falls at UW-Whitewater. The Warhawks take this one on their home field, man, 13-7. to Talk to me. Yeah, you know, last week we talked a lot about how the loss for Whitewater might have ended their playoff hopes, but with this crazy WIAC, you know, I may have to refrain that statement. Just, mm -hmm. there's, there's no way to really tell, but – the Warhawks defense stood very tall against uh, an electrifying River Falls offense. They got dealt with some uh, – turned the ball over in their own territory and then making huge stops. Um, uh, Whitewater won the time of possession battle 37-22, to 22, which was astounding. Like, you rarely see a, a lopsided uh, time of possession by that margin. And I think that was due to the fact they ran the ball for 225 yards. Uh, that's pretty effective run game, Kobe. Yes. Yeah, it is. And, and this uh, River Falls offense, I mean, putting up this kind of game without Blaha still under center, right? It doesn't seem like, uh, you know, obviously we want him to make a comeback here, but um, it doesn't seem like that's going to be the case. Jackson Christ under center uh, for this this squad, at least uh, this weekend. And, or no, excuse me, Jackson Christ is other side of the other side of the ball here. But um, Jesus, Ball is coughing up along in front of me. Um, but anyways, but going back to this this Whitewater team, right? At home, you talk about a rebound win for this squad, and you look at the WIAC standings right now. Platteville right now leads everyone, 7-1 overall, 4-1 inside of WIAC play. Oshkosh right there with them when it comes to conference play. And then you've got this, this middle ground, right? You've got Lacrosse. You've got Stout. You've got Whitewater. All sitting at 3-2 and two apiece with uh, some room and still some things 
very much to be figured out kind of in those those middle regions right there. Very much still up for grabs. I mean, this last couple weeks of the season is going to be just about as ridiculous as it gets in the, the best conference in D3. Yeah, and like we saw, it's just it's almost like it's like cannibalism. We're just eating each other alive because like, you have all these great teams, but if everyone's going to have losses, maybe even multiple losses, it's going to be hard for the, the committee to have more than ma- – maybe even just one WAC team with all the losses. I mean, I would hope there's going to be at least two or three, but depending on how the rest of the season goes, like you just never know with all these crazy matchups because everyone has beaten everyone other than Eau Claire and Stevens Point. So there's just a lot of crazy football going on up here. Yep, 100%. And sorry, going back to that quarterback room, I had the wrong thing pulled up. But Riley Warzynski, Cade Fitzgerald, those two under center for this River Falls offense. Warzynski getting the majority of the under center reps there uh, for the Falcons of the River Hawks. But 17-28, um, 221, did have a pick through the air. River Falls, and I didn't have too much going on the ground. The 50 yards compared to that 225 you mentioned with Whitewater did have some some good performances through the air, and their defense did step up, I think, in a big way, and that's why this game, I believe, was so competitive. Michael Brown, Braden Wolf, both had interceptions for this River Falls defense. You had guys like Gage Tim, 15 tackles in the day, Jim. Had a sack, three and a half TFLs, a PBU. That's a great performance. Uh, Andrew Shoemaker, 13 tackles of his own, was also in the backfield. Cade Schmidt, 10 tackles. Like You go down this list, there were so many big contributors for this River Falls defense and still just wasn't enough. And, I mean, you're, really, you're seeing, I think it's just the Blaha effect when it comes down to it. The dynamic ability and what he brings to this offense, they're very sorely missing that. And, and I, a team that we obviously have been very high on this year, I just don't think they have enough without him to make that that kind of this end-of-the-season push that they're going to need. It's you know looking a little bit too, too little too late for them, two and three in conference right now. Yeah, it's just unfortunate because, you know, you look back at the beginning of the season, weeks two through four, they scored 66-plus points in all three of those games. Yeah. Like, their offense was looking like it was going to set some records this year. But, unfortunately, uh, a friend of the show of ours, Caleb, is just banged up, man. And just you, you hate to see anyone get hurt, you know, even rival or not. You know, it's just brutal. You hate injuries. Hate them. Yeah, especially playing at the level that he was at, right? You talked about, like, potentially going and setting some records and doing some things in the conference that um, previously had just not been done before. So, nonetheless, not to take away from it, big win for Whitewater. They bounce back, get a a big win in conference play. Let's move over out of the WIAC. Montclair State at Rowan, 16-10 in double OT. This game, to preface, my understanding of it, Jim, I've been very, very new to this one, the breakfast bowl out here, um, the yes, pork sir. roll versus Taylor ham, basically the naming rights to a very popular breakfast sandwich and pork product out here. That's what this game is all about. I think it's hilarious. I absolutely love it. The fact that we've got a neat trophy that we'll show here in a minute um, of this big pig on it, like just ridiculous. But talk to me about the actual game before we get going about the, uh, you know, the food and some of the stuff outside of it. So, uh, Rowan's defense completely balled out, uh, generating three interceptions, which is just, you're going to win a lot of football games. You need to pick the other team off three times. But uh, anyway, I found it pretty funny. So this game went to double overtime. Neither team scored in the first overtime. Yeah. Like, you typically, I mean, when the game goes to multiple overtimes, you'd think score, score, score. No, mm-hmm. this was a defensive battle all the way. Um, Greg Casimir actually tied the game up with just two seconds ago on a 49-yard field goal. And that's that's kind of a bomb. And especially at the college level. I mean, I say NFL, impressive you know, nonetheless. You, you look over that, 49 yards is not an easy field goal. Um, and then Luke Hokey scored the game winner. Three and five. I wanted to say Hokey, like Hokey Pokey, but it might, it might be Hoke. I don't know. But I wanted to roll with it. But he had the game winner to uh, seal it for Rowan in this one over Montclair State. So really, really exciting game in this one. Total slugfest. It was. And, and Montclair State didn't even score until the fourth quarter. Like, that was the first three quarters. They're held scoreless. Talk about that defensive effort on the other side from uh, from the Owls there. And that's that's just something that, again, Ben, don't break and just absolutely have this great performance. Let up a score near the end. It goes into double OT. They got to be thinking, man, we let up 10 points. Like, this game should be over. So that's the game winner. And then you go to, I'll show a little bit of just like the celebration on the field. But this, this game feels like a, a pretty pivotal one for Rowan and where they're at uh, with their season. Did you get a chance to look at the actual trophy? Did you see that? I, I did not see it. I need to. I need to. Is it on the other? Uh... 
No, I, I don't think I, I got to share the. I got to hold on. Hold on. Oh, let me. Oh, I was. Let me share I, this I with you so you can. See, let me share this so you can see it. It's all that. It's going to make me. Yeah, please do. Hold please on. Do. Let's see. Yes, this trophy, dude. You can see it right there. Hold up in the middle. The big pig on a pedestal oh. is like one of the coolest things, um, you know, on that this level of football. That was just a little bit of a scene from the on, on field celebration post game that I got another good video uh, with the trophy in the locker room that we can take a look at here. Hold on a minute. Let me pull this one up, Jim, because this one is this one's pretty neat as well. <laughs> one of the cooler trophies, I think, in college football. And there's some good ones out there, but this is like the uh, origination of it, I think, is really oh, fun. Man. And kind of the, the way it got started, there's a good frame of it right there. Holding it, the Breakfast Bowl trophy, pig with wings on it, it appears. See the yeah. Breakfast Bowl champs? <laughs> This thing is awesome. awesome. It's big. It's oh, massive. Man, so this huge, is inside dude. the uh, like locker. Like there, eating the sandwich <laughs> post game, which is really great. Uh, I don't know oh, where the dude. heck this uh, Macklemore esque jacket came from. To be honest with you, he went thrift shopping, man. He did, bro. They, <laughs> they are eating it up, though. I love this. Uh, some really good energy post game for for these guys. And uh, like you said. 16 to 10 win, oh, double OT statement win for this squad. And, you know, a four and four record on the year. This isn't necessarily going to put them into playoff contention. They already lost a couple of games inside a conference play. So um, not necessarily that kind of program defining win, but, you know, a homecoming game for them against a, now a, a new rivalry, so to speak. So a couple of games to, to close out the year inside of the NJAC, but uh, really a, a fun, a fun win, if nothing else there, Jim, for, for these guys. Yeah, that's good stuff, man. That locker room stuff, that's why you play football, man. That's yeah. good. I celebrate with your teammates after a win. Like, that's all the hard work you put in all through the summer, the winter. Like, man, oh, man. That's, that's, that's what it's all about right there. And we do need to talk about it. Lacrosse, they pick up a big win over your Blue Devils. Just another one where maybe just a player too short for Stout this past weekend. And uh, another strong running attack from this eagle offense from lynch and company but talk to me about this one what do we need to know about this game yeah lax made a lot of big time plays you know you just got to tip the cap there um made a huge safety uh, in the third quarter uh to take their first lead of the game um now both of us are now in kind of a winner go home situation as uh lacrosse takes on whitewater next week and then we have oshkosh but um gabe lynch had a hell of a game for them 166 yards and a touchdown on the ground um and then obviously Tucker Hokinson had a like a moss, if you will, and it was a really controversial call. I think it was a catch, but he caught it, hit to the fell to the ground in the end zone for like a good second or two, and then the DB like poked it out, and then like obviously they called it a touchdown. The lacrosse sideline was up in arms about it. They were like almost running out of the field, like what? Like it's a terrible call because in real time it was like it looked like he dropped the ball, but in, once you I went back and looked, it's like mm, I think he did have possession of it because you know obviously you can just go to the ground and just lose lose it on like the transfer yep. or whatever you call it but um yeah a lot of a lot of good performances in the blue doubles on defense as well i gotta give a shout out to brooks brewer with 14 tackles that's big that, that's uh that's pretty good but um yeah just coming up a little short in this one um just absolute heartbreaker they had a long touchdown right at the end of the game gave us about a minute um a minute to go do something with it and Took a sack, and then we had to try to chuck it up, and then it was an uh, interception. But Adam Moen had a hell of a game for us. He played his tail off, um, just falling up short at the end. You just got to chuck it up and give your guy a chance, and that's what he did. You know, just didn't fall our way. You've seen that result a couple times with your Bears, too. Oh. <laughs> At least I don't think anyone on. Uh, I mean, dude, you're just you're just pouring salt in the wound. Though. Yeah, I don't think anyone on your side in this one was, uh, you know, potentially celebrating prematurely, though. Yeah, no, that no. was ridiculous. We know, they've been, like, they've been going yeah, through like, it. Yeah, and our motto all year has been to keep swinging, and like right now is the perfect time to just keep swinging. It's like we got two big games left. Yeah, and the in the locker room we're like, all right, if we win out, we're giving ourselves a chance. So we're gonna focus on. Practice tomorrow, practice on Wednesday, practice on Thursday, practice on Friday, and then the game. It's like one day at a time. Got to be mature after a loss, obviously. Um, just got to keep keep showing up. And then I hear you. Fighting because Oshkosh is – they've, they've gotten away with uh, – and they made some pretty crazy comebacks against us last year and the year before. And we, uh, we're, we've had this one worked on the calendar. We're excited for it for sure. And obviously Absolutely. the uh, Kobe Berghammer reunion. Yep. Too. 
So that'll be a fun one for him. You see one of the takeaways here as we roll the tape for that uh, lacrosse defense. 33-31, the final. The Eagles take the win there. That was kind of the the last-ditch effort there, and uh, things didn't go your way this weekend. Gabe Lynch, like we had kind of mentioned, another strong game on the ground for him. 16 carries, 163 yards, and a touchdown. He has been a machine these last couple weeks and I think has all the traits uh, of maybe a really great back that is an all-purpose type guy for this offense. He's shifty enough. He's powerful enough, elusive enough, and fast enough, right? Maybe he doesn't excel at one thing, but he is damn good at a lot of them, and uh, he can really do it all for this offense. I think his balance and ability to break off of tacklers and some of those ankle ankle biters, if you will, out in the open field has really separated him, but he's just as good inside the box in between the tackles. So I've enjoyed watching some of the tape on him the last couple of weeks. Had a lot of different receivers get involved for this UWL squad. I mean, two guys with 80 yards, a couple more with 50 or 30, and it's like just spreading the ball all around. Uh, Kyle Haas doing a great job of that, 22 for 38 through the air, and uh, this offense showing some flashes of what we've seen previously from you know the UWL squad, and it's a little different with a different character under center that doesn't quite have that same skill set, but still a very potent one, right? That takeaway at the end, uh, Carver Cram, he had the, the interception to, to seal the deal for lacrosse, but Move forward, a couple other ones to hit on quickly here. Moravian at number seven, Susquehanna, 49-34. This one a little bit tougher of a contest for the Riverhawks than maybe a lot of people anticipated it. Yeah, I mean, that definitely a little bit of a scare. By, but like, like we always say, it's like any given Saturday, you got to show up no matter who you're playing, face this opponent. And maybe they were underestimating them a little bit, but still came out on top. And this is Susquehanna team, too, that, you know, if you remember, was the only one to get the best of Cortland, I believe it was last year, right? They got that win, um, you know, early on. And, and this is a team that has played really well against great competition. What you don't want to see here, and not that Meridian is a bad squad, but you don't want to see them play down potentially to their opponent. And that's what it feels like potentially might have happened here. At home, nonetheless, Meridian squad coming into the game was 5-2, and two, right? Playing some really good football. But uh, the Susquehanna team started off very slow. Only 14 points in the first half for the Riverhawks. They would go on to score 35 in the second half. Yeah, you know, you can only hope to contain a team for so long. You know, obviously, you know, first half, whatever. Make your adjustments at halftime, and obviously Susquehanna did a very good job of doing that. No, 100%. And you look here. I mean, we're talking Moravian leads 20-14 to 14 at the end of the second half, uh, the first half, excuse me, second quarter. Susquehanna would go on to score three touchdowns and uh, unanswered, that is. 21 points unanswered, 35-20 to 20 they led, and then it got a little bit closer near the end. Uh, touchdown in the fourth quarter from Jordan Bingham for that Moravian squad, made it 34-42. But uh, Susquehanna, they closed out the deal late in the fourth quarter. Three minutes left, Matt Surtz runs it in from about 69 yards out to be the exclamation point and kind of the dagger for this squad. But looking forward for this Riverhawks team. Right now, again, they're number seven going into this week. They're eight and one right now. They're one loss against Cortland, a 40 to 38 loss in week three of the season. Undefeated right now inside of the landmark conference. They got one more game at Lycoming coming uh, this coming week, the stag hat game. I was not aware of that one. Kind of a neat little deal. But they win that one. I, I believe they might have already clinched, to be honest with you. But uh, you win that one. You're undefeated in conference. You take the landmark title. And with that automatic bid into the playoffs, the one blemish on your record that lost to Cortland, they already beat a really quality Brockport team earlier in the season. And this team seems to be offensively catching their rhythm at the right time. The last time they scored less than 40 points, Jimmy, was in week four, if that says anything. Um, they've scored above wow. 40 against every conference opponent so far. So th this this Riverhawk offense is certainly playing at a very high clip. So we'll see what they do moving forward. But another one that I wanted to touch on from us here, and another one that had some really big conference title implications on the line inside of the Centennial, Johns Hopkins playing host Muhlenberg. JHU coming into this one, number 22 in the country. They win 26-13. And this is a game that has been incredibly competitive in the past, dude. I, you remember the the miracle at Muhlenberg last year 
right? The kind of botched kick brought in for a touchdown. And this game has gone incredibly back and forth, I think, over the years. But this one in favor of the Blue Jays as they try and pull up some of the tape here for us to take a look at. This one finishes up 26-13 and, of Switch course. Square. I mean, give me a break. Another ad on these. I, oh, Whatever, I'll let that roll. Um, but, again, this most likely decides the winner of the Centennial. They are facing 5-3 and three Dickinson next week, which should be at least a little bit of a challenge for this Johns Hopkins squad. To close off the year, it's 1-7 and seven McDaniel. So it feels like Johns Hopkins, although they're going to win out, they're going to win the conference, they might not afford that same home field advantage throughout the playoffs this year. Yeah, maybe not. And uh, they'll be tested certainly on the road. It's obviously a lot harder to when you're not playing at home. But I think no, no matter how they get in, they'll be happy. So, oh, they definitely will. Now I finally got the the damn tape up here. We'll see some of these some of these runs here, and um, you're, they're going to get that automatic bid, assuming they take care of business these next two weeks, which is not necessarily a safe assumption. They still have to go out there uh, and, and get the job done. But like we talked about, they probably are not going to have that home <laughs> advantage throughout the playoffs for this season. And I think that's going to be a big piece for them. That was a, that was a big reason I believe of their success last year. Talk about hosting teams like Randolph Macon and some other squads that they had at home. And I think that was a big reason why they were able to get the job done maybe in the way that they did, but some individual performances from this one under center, James Ranello for Johns Hopkins, 23 of 36, 249, two touchdowns, no giveaways through the air on the ground, 17 carries for 84 yards. So really doing it all was him, and then you got E.J. Tolarico, I believe. Seven catches, 134 yards, two touchdowns through the air for him and Johns Hopkins, and uh, the defense certainly made some plays as well. Carson Bordo, who we had on the show here just semi-recently, two picks, 76 yards total returned. I do believe, let me double-check, I think one of those Twice was nice. brought back. Yes, it was. The fourth quarter to close out – uh, the game, he takes that one 70 yards. How about that to close out the game? Exclamation point for this Johns Hopkins squad. Yeah, that's definitely a dagger. That's quite literally the definition of a dagger. Yeah. So. Um, otherwise, some games worth mentioning across the, the D3 slate that maybe we didn't highlight here. Uh, it, it, back in the WIAC number 9, UW Oshkosh, they hold off Eau Claire. 42-31, a little bit of a closer result than I think you and I were expecting. You know, as funny as this may sound, because Eau Claire is a really good offense. Like, they're going to put up points on a lot of teams. They're going to move the ball. I think they just struggle a lot defensively. That's just at least what I saw from my point of view when we played them last week. But, man, they, they can move the ball. They got Garside. They got Rubidu throwing on the ball. And, uh, man, they got, a, they got a lot of playmakers over there. So, expect them to keep putting up points against really, really good opponents. And then moving over to perhaps the other top conference here in the pack, number 19, Washington and Jefferson. They beat Case Western Reserve 34-21. There's been a lot of competitive games inside of the heart of that conference. Washington and Jefferson has certainly separated themselves as one of those squads. we got a few pack teams ranked in the top 25, so it'll be interesting to see how exactly that conference plays out. And actually, as I'm talking about it, I kind of want to – I need to pull up the – standings for the conference here right now as it stands inside of the PAC Washington and Jefferson does lead eight and one uh, closely followed by Carnegie Mellon and Grove City though at seven and one both respectively so there's going to be some big time games coming shortly um, let me see who they close out we're going to pump up the pack in our uh, conference rankings next year you know, we absolutely are to... so Washington and I Jefferson a little bit of a little bit of hate for not putting him on there, but uh, no, yeah, I, yeah. people on Twitter, but they did definitely earned our uh, earned their respect for sure. Washington and Jefferson's one loss on the year came at home against Carnegie Mellon in overtime. I think I lost him, but that is uh, we lost Jimmy there near the end of it. But uh, a lot of great football happening in the pack. I appreciate y'all tuning in to, to this piece, and we'll close things out with Matt Schwarzler on the NAIA scene. <laughs> A lot of great games in the NAIA this weekend, so much so that uh, everything is the, the quick hitter today, dude. We're going to try and get through uh, you know, all the best stuff, starting off with the Franciscan Bowl, Matt? Can we Franciscan officially? Franciscan Bowl, officially. I think we can officially stake that claim. Okay. If we can't, I did it, so I really nice. don't care at this point. So, For those uh... unfamiliar with said bowl, <laughs> talk to me about these two squads. 
Yeah, so uh, St. Francis, Illinois, not to be confused with St. Francis, Indiana, who's the other team in this rivalry. Uh, obviously, they are very close in proximity to each other. They're on separate sides of the same state border, and uh, they're both pretty damn good football teams. So mm -hmm. You can imagine that this rivalry in conference gets pretty heated, and it definitely did not disappoint 19-ranked St. Francis of Illinois loses to unranked St. Francis of Indiana who uh, received votes in the poll this week after the big win or is in the rankings. Number 22. Um, yeah, number 22. So good for them. They've had a sneaky good 7-2 and two season so far. Um, and this game was no exception. They slowed St. Francis of Illinois' run game down. Uh, that's what they really hung their hat on. Forced their quarterback to throw, who ended up going uh, 17 for 37. Clearly wasn't as comfortable airing it out, which worked to... Uh, St. Francis, Indiana's advantage, and they get it done at home. I'm trying to like, I I'm, I probably just need to start using mascots because Saints and Cougars, Cougars the yes, Saints. yeah. So uh, the Cougars in the blue there on the video get it done. So uh, absolutely great game from this squad, proving that they are worth being in the top 25. Yeah, they were under a lot of people's radars, mine included, to start the year, and they have just impressed. So good for them. Big time win, not the first of them when it comes to nationally ranked opponents. They've had, you know, a couple in back to back weeks, and we talked with uh, Josh earlier on. You saw the big man touchdown for them against Marion. Oh yeah, uh huh, dude, absolutely, dude. That was outrageous. <laughs> but no, they're playing all seriousness, playing some really good ball. The two blemishes on their record against an Indiana Wesleyan squad that we know what exactly what to expect from them, and then another uh, really solid team in Taylor. So those are the two losses right now, and you still have a chance for them. Everything's still ahead of them. They take care of business. Um, you would assume maybe potentially these next couple of weeks still have a lot of ball to be played. But move on. Campbellsville, a team that had an incredibly hot start to the season, still playing some really good ball against Bethel, a nationally ranked opponent. The Tigers get it done 14-10, dude. So if you, if I told you that Campbellsville uh, did not score in the second half, would you tell me they won this game? Most likely, no. Knowing football, I would say that that's kind of ridiculous. Yeah. Um, if I wasn't, if the box score was not right in front of me, then <laughs> probably not. <laughs> yeah, not even that. I'll one-up you. They only scored one quarter and they win 14 to 10 yeah. in what was a pretty gnarly uh, weather game for a little bit of this, uh, as you will see from the Bethel passing statistics, Kate Hewitt, two for 12 for 22 yards. Um, clearly, while uh, Campbellsville didn't have problems airing out the ball, it clearly got to Bethel, uh, not to mention Campbellsville's defense played absolutely lights out in the second half. The fact that your offense gets grounded to a halt by a very good Bethel defense and you're still able to put up enough of a fight after what I assume is a very exhausting second half yeah. and pull out a win is super impressive. Campbellsville still back at the top of the Mid-South after this win. And honestly, they are one win away against Georgetown next week from very seriously considering a playoff run. That they are, and, and look, taking a look at those those mid south standings, that's exactly where I was going with this as well. Georgetown, right now, just a step above, undefeated in sign of uh, the conference play at four and zero. But Campbellsville, Lindsey Wilson, three and one, right behind them. Now, Lindsey Wilson does have the head to head over Campbellsville. That is their one loss on the year. So we'll see if, depending on the result this you know this coming week, we'll see what that does for them and if that'll even come to, into play. But it seems like those three uh, have separated themselves from the rest of the competition. Uh, are both Cumberland and Cumberland's teams both playing some good ball, but not so much inside of conference play there. So like you said, the, the big matchup this weekend, Georgetown College for this Campbellsville team. They finish out the year uh, against Cumberland's, that's plural, the Patriots. So that, that's not exactly a gimme either, but that Georgetown result is certainly going to determine a lot inside of the Mid-South. But yeah. Looking ahead to the matchups for next week, too, we get a lot of clarity. We usually have more clarity at this point in the season, but uh, yeah. we're finally cleaning things up. There's a lot of top 25 matchups to keep your eyes on. So That there is another big-time one. We'll go out west for this one, top 25. Number 21, Carroll, taking on number 8, Southern Oregon. Both these squads with a plethora of statement wins on the season, but uh, this time, talk, just talk to me. Talk to me about what happened in this one. This this Carroll team has defied all logic and is so close to finishing off the demon that is the chaos of the Frontier Conference. 
Um, they have only lost one conference game at the beginning of the season mm -hmm. and they are rolling and they beat Southern Oregon. Who's one of the teams in their way, 21, 17 in this fashion. Um, and they looked really good doing it. Obviously Carroll has a massive home field advantage. They play in one of the sickest stadiums in the NAI, yeah, one do. of the classic programs, uh, of the NAI as well, uh, known for national title runs, Getting back to their roots, this Carroll team looks absolutely phenomenal. Jack Perka absolutely dialed in 22 for 31, 280 and a touchdown, um, and a very balanced rushing and receiving uh, effort from this entire offense. They look good. Their defense looks good. And Carroll just might finish this thing off. It's certainly what it feels like. If I had the – did you see the the helicopter flyover at the beginning of this year as we rolled the tape? I'm going to play not. that one more time for you right here. <laughs> Look at that. Oh, wow. That is yeah, sick. Those I'm, aren't your normal. Those are the double copter type situation. Those things are sweet. I don't even know what those are called, but it gets me amped up. I mean, I would love to see that going over on game day. Dude, I, it's it's different in the frontier, man. It's a whole different league out there. Um, also, I think it's worth mentioning Gunnar Yates while uh, losing, still having a very productive yes. day on the ground and uh, in the receiving game. Uh, over 60 yards and uh, two touchdowns to his name uh, yep. on both the rushing and receiving end. So uh, still things to look forward to for this Southern Oregon squad, but now it's just Montana Western and Carroll who again play next week at the top of the frontier. And I think uh, what's also worth noting about this Carroll squad is seven to one right now. They lost to open up the year against a Montana tech team that yes, is a frontier conference team, but it's one of those situations where you got them twice. And yep. that's actually could really come into play for this Carroll squad because they lose to Montana Tech, who was then the number 21 team in the country. And now, yes, you can't look ahead of this Montana Western squad or else you're going to be in a lot of trouble. But then you're at Montana Tech to close the year, and that in Butte, and that is the, uh, that's the conference game against those guys. So that really could come back to be a very influential piece of this if they can take care of business these next couple of weeks. Um, technically are undefeated inside of conference play right now, even though they've got a loss to that Montana Tech squad. Yeah, uh, very important for this Carroll team. They are close to slaying the demon, but they are not done. They have two weeks left. So um, I will believe it when I see it that the frontier chaos is dead, but for now it reigns supreme. So uh, good for the Saints. Yes, it does. Let's go down south. St. Thomas out of Florida, still making waves, like I did there with that one. Um, but mm. they take the win over uh, a southeastern squad that uh, quite literally has kind of been on fire. 20-17, to 17, Bobcats win this one, Matt. Yeah, uh, this is a solid win for St. Thomas, obviously on the road in a hostile southeastern environment. Um, this game, to me, more so proved a lot more about Southeastern than St. Thomas. We already knew St. Thomas was a top five, very good football team. But Southeastern absolutely came to play. Holding Rontavious Farmer to under 150 yards by any defense is honestly very yep. impressive. Uh, under five yards per carry for him, which is not very normal. Um, and Keely Watson, two picks on the day. Uh, this Southeastern defense really got after it. Obviously, St. Thomas is still a very good football team, so they ultimately win. But man, I Southeastern is looking like a sneaky playoff team because their only losses could potentially be to Kaiser and uh, number yeah. five St. Thomas. So, yeah, it's a uh, it's a good spot to be. St. Thomas surviving a couple slippery weeks in a row, um, but you got to win your stinkers. So uh, <laughs> good for them for getting it done. And like I said, the Southeastern win is not a bad win by any means. And you talk about that man right there in the backfield for the Bobcats. Farmer is now the all-time rushing leader of any level of collegiate football in the state of Florida. Incredible. This was last week, by the way. This was October 26th. This isn't even based off this week's performance. He already eclipsed this mark, but we didn't. I don't know if we mentioned it on the show. That is a ridiculous statistic. Yeah, when I'm saying that Rontavious Farmer having 103 133 yards rushing on the day is like low for him. That should be the indicator. That's borderline <laughs> lockdown. Yeah. I mean, we are talking like Ashton Genty times 30 right here. Like just <laughs> yardage upon yardage upon yardage. This guy gets it done. And uh, it's why St. Thomas is as good as they are is because Rontavious Farber like just is the, is the bull cow for this, uh, for the St. Thomas offense.
I'm right with you there. And like you said, this Southeastern team, I mean, 5-1 and one heading into that game, right? And they had the game – they had a game canceled against Florida Memorial. I think that was uh, mm-hmm. – Sort of like a hurricane type deal yeah. or something down there, but um, you close out the the year with Ave Maria and Thomas, and you know could could stand to really have a good year. And like you said, those two losses, not a lot of moral victories there, but two not very bad losses on the uh, on the schedule there for that uh, for that squad. But we'll keep it going. Our pick for the game of the week this week, McPherson, Evangel. We had talked about this, had kind of hoped that it would live up to the expectations that we had for when it came to the KCAC and uh, the implications there of conference standings. I think it did just about all of that. Yeah, uh, McPherson, a sleeper team that I had been looking at as a potential top 25 on my own list, and then they pull this off. And now I have to put them in my top 15 because this is just a fantastic win for them. Uh, This Evangel team has been rolling all season and to go into their house and play like they played is Mm -hmm. extremely impressive. Um, And not to mention this now puts McPherson at the top of their division, the KCAC. They do close out the year against friends in Southwestern, which will be two very big tests for them. But if I'm McPherson, I control my own destiny and that's a fantastic spot to be Evangel, obviously with their first loss on the season here, unfortunately, and their first ever KCAC loss in school history. Um, because they've only been the KCAC for like two years. So. I was gonna say that's a relatively <laughs> yeah. new deal, but still a stat. <laughs> yeah. Stat that, yes. yes but you're still right. That atop um, the Kessinger right now alone yeah. are, are the Bulldogs, and that's that's huge. Yeah, they've been building and building the past couple of years. We've been waiting for them to climb that hill, and they've been getting more wins. And this year's the year where they've clearly put it together. Um, just a fantastic effort all around. Need to give a shout out also to Jalil Brown on McPherson. Yes. Over 100 yards receiving with 115 on the day and 132 rushing yards and two touchdowns to boot. Incredible uh, backfield threat in both the rushing and receiving game. Talked about Gunnar Yates, how important it can be. And uh, Jalil Brown, like, one up to that performance. So He did, and he was one of our nominees for the Player of the Week Awards. And I, I just... The awards are tougher every week to yeah. figure out who the hell gets them. And it's like every week someone just outdo outdoes the next person. It, it is yeah. absolutely outrageous and it's so hard to pick uh, from just it's one ridiculous. of those. But <laughs> it, it's crazy. But let's go. Uh, let's talk about number seven, Benedictine. And then at uh, number 12, Mid America, Nazarene. This was a close one and was anything but a defensive struggle. Yeah, uh, there was no defense to be had here. Um, this was a shootout. Final score was 48-47. I will give a shout. Benedictine did lose, but they lived and died by the two-point conversion. Yes. And I can respect that 100%. Uh, the last touchdown of the game, the extra point attempt, uh, Benedictine went for two to put it away. Yep. And they did not get it. Jackson Dooley's pass fell incomplete. But, man, both these quarterbacks, Adrian uh, Parsons and Jackson Dooley combining for 10 touchdowns, each throwing for 10 or each throwing for five, excuse me. Um, and not to mention, man, the last like m- minute of this game was just chaos. Yeah. <laughs> like pedal to the metal for both these squads of just like one last push to try and get it done. Mm hmm. Yeah, and that was the what ended up being the game-winning score here um, because, like you said, the of the failed two-point attempt there for the Ravens. But um, you, you talked also about that Adrian Parsons stat line. He won some, some Player of the Week honors as well. Very deservingly so. You take a look at the stats that he put up on Saturday. Check out. He is the uh, NAIA National Player of the Week for good reason. Mm-hmm. 374 yards and five touchdowns. It's a nice ring to it. I don't know what we got, like the Shadur here with the Apple Watch. I'm not exactly sure what's going on with the posing. We I could love it. maybe improve in that it. department. But uh, <laughs> on the field, he's doing just fine. Yeah, needs to get his defenders. Uh, he gets up the Compass app so he can direct the defense <laughs> since they're so lost. Um, That was terrible. I apologize. But I think it's worth mentioning what's not terrible were the receivers in this game. Benedictine had three receivers over 100 yards receiving. Uh, Mid-American Nazarene had just two. Um, Rushing attacks for both games were great. And like I said, man, the quarterbacks balled out. Dooley, 20 for 32, 413 yards and five touchdowns. Parsons, 26 for 40, 374 yards, five touchdowns. My God. (laughs) Amen. A lot of scoring. 
that there was, and we'll finish it off at least with some of the highlights. The GPAC has kind of taken a back seat uh, on this program a little bit of some of these other conferences, KCAC, the Frontier, and I think it's a good little refresher to get right back into it. Morningside, Northwestern, I think this is exactly the kind of game that we've come to expect from these two squads. Yeah, I think I think them being in Iowa is detrimental because the Big Ten is like infecting everything around it <laughs> um, and making these disgusting low scoring games a thing. Usually this is a much higher scoring game, but it is fun to see that both these teams can play elite defense still. Um, my biggest note here is that while Morningside is having a very good end of their season, they're peaking at the right time. I'm a little concerned for Northwestern right now. Obviously, they drop this game. They play Dort next week, whose hair yeah. is on fire. Dort also has the chance. This is the best year that we've seen for them to get their first win over Northwestern in school history. Yep. They've never beaten Northwestern in the rivalry game for the 17 or 18 years that they've played it. So uh, Dort smells blood in the water after watching this one. Northwestern's offense... Uh, uncharacteristically not putting up a lot of points and same with boarding side but man it is they have an interest interesting situation going on at northwestern um right now i don't know they don't look like a top 20 team to me like we've come yeah. to expect from them um i'm very curious to see how the door game goes next week yep um so I think the way you put it, done, it perfectly, a blood in the water yeah. of like that. This is our window, right? This is our time to do it. And I think I'm sure that's kind of the maybe the unspoken rhetoric around there. I don't know if that's something that they would come out right and say, but um, finish it off with some quick hitters. Start off with the uh, with the mid south, dude. Back to it. Yeah, Lindsey Wilson. We talked about Lindsey Wilson kind of on the outside looking in. Gets a big leg up with a win over number twenty two Cumberland, twenty to seventeen, in an absolute scrap. Also, number 13, Georgetown, staying in the Mid-South, uh, scrapes by Cumberlands, plural, of Kentucky, oh, yeah. the Patriots, 19-16. to 16. And then after that, uh, number three, Indiana Wesleyan, outpaces Concordia Ann Arbor, Michigan, in a surprisingly high-scoring contest, 48-24, yeah. uh, to 24, Concordia putting up a good fight, but Indiana Wesleyan just continuing to put up 45-plus points every week is horrifying. Yep. And number one, Kaiser. Having, I wouldn't say like the biggest scare, like terrifying. Not, yeah, yeah. I'm not talking like 2007 Appalachian State over Michigan type <laughs> upset, but I'm talking like eyebrow raised. You know, uh, Kaiser surviving a scare against Weber, 34 to 20. Uh, Weber playing teams pretty close, so I will give them their respect. Uh, and like I said earlier, gotta win your stinkers, so they survive. Something to look forward to there. And something worth noting outside of the top 25 points, three and six point defeated top seeded Pikeville in the AAC on a botched icing the kicker attempt. And by the way, they are still in contention for the, the conference title. How does that even work? Uh, because all three of their wins have come in conference. So they are three and one in conference. And since they beat top oh my gosh. ranked Pikeville, they are now tied with Pikeville and have the tiebreaker over Pikeville. Um, and for clarification yeah. on the botched icing, the kicker, as in went for the game-winning field goal, missed the game-winning field goal, but they called a timeout, so they got to redo it, and they point kicks the field goal to win the second time. <laughs> Unreal. I mean, you look at <laughs> you look at their losses, too, this year. Like you had mentioned, three and six. You open the year at Bethel. Then you come back at home against Lindsey Wilson. Then you're at D1 Davidson at yeah. D2 Allen. What a, that's a gauntlet. That is a really tough way to open the year. You start the year 0 and 5. Yeah. And I now mean, here we are I... winning three out of your last four. And you kind of mentioned getting hot at the right time, right inside a conference play. And you've got a Union Commonwealth team coming in. Uh, to town next week that I'll be honest, I have no clue about them. And then you're at Bluefield in Virginia. It should be, you would imagine, a decent contest. But, yeah, wow. Union Commonwealth, a team that's kind of come up from the ground. Uh, they were not winning at all, and now they're winning a little bit. So they're okay. a decent team and doing well this year, but point. But that Pikeville win, I mean, that's statement. Ah, that's huge. That's huge. And even if people want to argue with the ending, like, you still won at the end of the day. 
So that's that. But yeah, look at that three-way tie at the top of that conference. Um, I think Pikeville still is a buy, so they're four and one, but obviously three and one. Reinhardt would usually win in most years, but they're having an off year. They're five and four. Um, still at the top of the conference, but yeah, the AAC is chaotic as ever. I have no idea what's going on. Um, and hopefully we'll get some more answers about the playoffs uh, this weekend. Yeah. There's a lot of top 25 matchups on. Hopefully we can talk a little bracketology. I would like um, that. That'd be cool. I, yeah, I'd, lo- I'd love to, but we'd be here for like an hour because there's still so many hypotheticals that can happen. Um, I can't get over you know, starting 0-5 and, and potentially winning your conference. Isn't it crazy? I'm still I there. Mean, I'm, my brain's still there. You play so few conference games in the AAC that like I understand why you would just want to go play a bunch of good teams and see where you stack up but like at some point you got to be worried about like <laughs> your standing right NAI that's still like you win the conference that's still an automatic bid correct yeah so yeah. as long as as long as they went out like wow so then there really left. is that's yeah. an incentive for them to go out and like you said play all of literally the best competition get a great measuring stick and then you come in and it's like being in the on deck circle swinging two bats. Yeah. No kidding. That's that's literally <laughs> what it's like. And not to mention all the out of conference competition for these teams is in the mid south, which yeah. has been very very good mm-hmm. in recent years and now you add Campbellsville to that mix of teams they could put potentially play with how good they are. It's I mean, they are not dodging the smoke and it is hell yeah. It hasn't bit them in the ass yet, man. So <laughs> just where we're at. Yeah, that's a great weekend, though, dude. Thank you. You killed yeah. it. I loved all the all the tidbits there. I think there's a lot of good info in there. I appreciate you, Matt. Yeah, of course, man. Anytime. Anytime. Absolutely. Well, that's all I got for you, dude. Have a good rest of your cool. night.